for delivering us from the greatest possible misery and giving us the greatest possible salvation. The misery we know is the misery of sin, of death, of the devil, and of hell itself. And deliverance is in the way of Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, becoming flesh, and living and dying for us, and then rising again on the third day. And when we consider that great deliverance from that awful misery, our response must be, how will I show my gratitude to God for all that he has done? And God replies, obey my ten commandments. And we should not be disappointed by God's response and say, but I wanted to show my gratitude some other way. Why must it be the Ten Commandments? But beloved, we do not get to choose how we show our gratitude to God. God chooses the way. God knows the way. The way that God has given to us in the Ten Commandments is a perfectly good and wise way in which we are to show our gratitude to God. Remember, as we saw in previous Lord's Day, that the law does indeed have a role in the Christian life. It has not been abolished. It's written on stone, remember. It has not been abolished. We must not misunderstand the law or misinterpret how the law is to be used in our lives. You see that in the preface to the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. Notice how the Ten Commandments begin in Exodus chapter 20. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Notice where God spoke all these words. He spoke these words at Mount Sinai after, notice, after he had delivered his people from the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage. He does not come to his people who are in bondage in Egypt and say, here are my ten commandments. Rather, he says, after he took them out of Egypt, here are my ten commandments. In light of the fact of what I have done, I am your God, you are my people, I have chosen you, I have loved you, I have redeemed you, and I have all of that, here is what I, your God, require of you to do. Love me, show your gratitude toward me by keeping my law. That is, my reasonable service. He didn't say either, I see you are in bondage, I now give you Ten Commandments, and if you keep these Ten Commandments, then I will deliver you from your bondage. No, he delivers first, and then we show our gratitude for that deliverance by keeping his law. And notice too, by way of introduction still, that the Ten Commandments are God-centered commandments. Notice how they begin with the first commandment. I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other God before me. If we were to write a law, we would start most likely with, thou shalt not kill, or thou shalt not steal, or some other commandment which affects man directly. God says, no, I am the most important. The commandments all begin with me. And so the commandments must begin the way they do begin, with the first commandment. Even the other commandments, later in the second table of the law, depend upon the first four. We love our neighbor by keeping the second table of the law for the sake of God who delivered us. And we cannot even begin to love our neighbor unless we first love God. God comes first. And that's why the first commandment must be love God 
Love God supremely, love God only, and have no other gods before him. Notice then, worshipping the one only true God. Worshipping the one only true God. Notice first the demand, then the prohibition, and finally the possibility. When God says in the first commandment, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, he does not mean, of all the gods out there, of all the possibilities of gods which you might worship, I am the greatest, so choose me. But rather, he says, I alone am God, therefore worship me. The first commandment, therefore, reveals to us that God alone is God, and He is one. It reveals to us that He is the one, simple, supreme God. This, of course, was denied by the people of that day. All the nations, right about the Israelites, worshipped many gods. Israel had been in Egypt for some 400 years before they came to Mount Sinai. And in Egypt, they worshipped all kinds of gods. They worshipped the sun god, they worshipped the god of the river Nile, they worshipped the god of fertility, they worshipped the god of good health, they worshipped crocodiles, they worshipped frogs, they worshipped creeping things of all kinds. And they assumed that that was the way that God should be worshipped. There's one kind of god for this, another kind of god for that. And now comes God with the Ten Commandments and says, No, no, there is one God, and I am that one God. That, of course, was how God revealed himself in the beginning, way back in Genesis 1. In the beginning, God and all the nations had corrupted this truth and made for themselves all kinds of other gods. And throughout Israel's history, they were tempted to worship different kinds of gods. Baal, Ashtoreth, Molech, Dagon, and many other kinds of gods. But God at the beginning of the Ten Commandments says, I am the only God. Worship me alone. The same is true in the New Testament. The apostles preached the gospel in the Greek and Roman world, and again, they were a society that worshipped many kinds of gods. Think only of the city of Athens in Greece, where there was a god on every street corner, and then just in case they might have missed one of the gods, and therefore offended that particular god, they had an idol saying, to the unknown god. And Paul came along and said, no, there is one God, the one God who made the heavens and the earth. And that, of course, was offensive to the people of that day. One of the crimes that the Christians were guilty of, according to the Romans and the Greeks, was that they only worshipped one God and were intolerant of all the other kinds of gods. And that is, of course, true in our society as well. Christianity is and always has been exclusive. Christianity says there is one God, there is one Jesus Christ, there is one Holy Spirit, there is one way of salvation through Jesus Christ. And that offends our tolerant, pluralistic, multicultural society today. We see too in this first commandment that God is not only a simple, unified being, but he is also a personal being. He is not an it, or a thing, or an impersonal force, or a mysterious power. He is personal. He is a living, intelligent being who says, I am, I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And of course, no impersonal force could speak that way. No impersonal force could speak at all. And if, let's say, 
you wanted to worship electricity or radioactivity, those things would not even be aware of the fact that you were worshiping them. But God is a personal, willing, thinking, intelligent God, and He knows, therefore, whether we worship Him or not. And He is deeply offended when men and women and children refuse to worship Him. Electricity, radioactivity, cannot demand wholehearted, exclusive devotion. But God does, and God can. And because God is personal, He is capable of being known and loved and worship. And more importantly, he is capable of revealing himself and loving <coughs> us and knowing us and entering into covenant fellowship with us in Jesus Christ. This commandment is worded negatively. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. However, this implies a positive calling. And the Heidelberg Catechism spells that out for us in Lord's Day 34. First, we are told we must rightly know God. Because it's impossible for us to keep the first commandment and to have no other gods before Jehovah God unless we know something about who this God is. He's not the God of our imagination. He's the God who reveals himself in the Holy Spirit. Scriptures. We must therefore make every effort to know this God, to find out who He is, to know His name, to know His characteristics, to know His glorious attributes, His perfections. What kind of God is He? He is holy, He is righteous, He is true, He is merciful, He is loving, He is eternal, He is almighty, and all the rest. We must know about His marvelous works. What has He done? What has this God done? In eternity, what has He done? In time, what has He done? Creation, providence, redemption. All of these things we must know and understand that we are to worship this one true God. That means very practically for us. We must use the means which God has given to us to know this God. If you were an Israelite at the foot of Mount Sinai when the law was first given and you asked yourself, how will I know this Jehovah God? How will I worship him? You would say, I must listen to Moses because Moses is the spokesman of this God. Moses is the mediator who brings to us information from this God. And today, how will I know who this God is and what he has done from the scriptures of truth. These scriptures are the way in which we will know God. You can't therefore keep the ten, ten Commandments, you can't keep the First Commandment in particular unless you read the Bible, study the Bible, come to hear the Bible preach, learn your catechism, and so on. That's how you will come to know rightly to know this one true God. Second, we have to trust God. We must have confidence in Him. We must be able, therefore, to rely upon Him. We must understand and believe that He is faithful to all of His promises so that we consciously lean upon Him and expect from Him every good thing. And this, of course, flows naturally out of knowledge. You will not trust a stranger, someone that you do not know. You will not trust an unknown God. The more you know God, the more you learn to know God, the more you will trust God. The more promises you understand from the Word of God, the more you will lean upon those promises and trust God, and God therefore will be honored in your trusting Him. And this Trusting in God develops over time. From Mount Sinai onwards, the Israelites were involved in a lesson of how to trust God. Time and time again, God put them out of the word to the test. Will you trust me? 
I have promised to bring you safely to Canaan. Will you trust me when there is no food? And of course, they didn't. They murmured. And God gave them manna. Will you trust me when there is no water? And again, they murmured and said, we're going to die of thirst in the wilderness. Will you trust me when an army of the enemy attacks you? And time and time again, they failed miserably in these tests. But gradually, over time, they learned to trust God. They learned that God was the utterly reliable and faithful and trustworthy God. This will be seen practically in our attitude to God. We are to submit ourselves to God in keeping this first commandment. We consciously and willingly put ourselves under God. And we say about this God, this God knows best. This God is wise. This God knows what I must do in my life. And when this God takes away from me things which I love, I will say about this God, this God loves me, this God cares for me, this God has my best in mind. I will hold, therefore, in trust to this God. It might look dark, I might not understand what God's doing with me at this time in my life, but I will continue to believe in this God. And I will fear Him too. The Catechism said we must fear Him. I will not be terrified of him, but I will fear him. I will trust him. I will be in awe of him. I will have a proper reverence for this God because he is so mighty and so awesome and so great. I will humble myself before him. I will seek to glorify him in everything that I do, and I will avoid at all costs, anything which will bring dishonor upon his name. And fourth, we must love him. We must have a deep affection for and delight in God. He must be the object of all of our desire. And this too will flow out of our knowledge for him. The more we know him, the more we will love him. The more we learn about him, the more we will desire him. And as we grow in our love for God, which is our calling under this first commandment, our love for other things will begin to decrease. Our love of the world, our love of riches, of honor, our desire to please men, all of these things will be swallowed up by our love for the one true and living goal, God. And the goal of this first commandment is that we see God as the highest, the supreme, the only good, and besides Him, everything else is vanity and meaningless. So we can say, God is my portion. If I have God, I have everything. There is nothing in all the world that I desire besides God. My whole being lives for and thirsts for and longs for the living God. That, in short, it is what the first commandment demands of us. And as you can see, the first commandment is a very tall order indeed. And God's children have often struggled to keep this commandment. We can see that in the story of Asa, which we read together earlier. King Asa was a godly descendant, a God-fearing son, of David, Judah's third king was this king Asa. Remember the split of the two kingdoms in Judah, Rehoboam, Abijah, Asa, and then Jehoshaphat, and so on. And this Asa, we are told, was a godly man, a true son of David, therefore, spiritually speaking. And he began his reign very well indeed. In fact, he began his rule over Judah with obedience to the first commandment. Notice what he did as soon as he became king. He introduced religious reforms. He took away the idolatry in the nation, the strange gods and the groves. 
And those groves are Asherah poles. That's the female version of the god Baal. He commanded Judah to seek after God, to seek to know who this God is. In other words, we could use the words of our Heidelberg Catechism, Asa learned rightly to know the only true God, and we know Asa trusted God, loved him, and submitted to him. In fact, so God-fearing was this Asa that he even put away his own grandmother from being queen. We read of that in chapter 15, verse 16. And also concerning Leaga, the mother or grandmother of Asa the king, he removed her from being queen, because she had made an idol in a grove, and Asa cut down her idol and stamped it and burnt it at the brook Kidron. So devoted was Asa to Jehovah his God, that not even his love for his grandmother would get in the way. You can say of him, in the words of question and answer 94, he renounced and forsook all creatures, even his own grandmother, rather than commit even the least thing contrary to God's will. And we see a marvelous example of Asa trusting God when the Ethiopians attacked him. In 2 Chronicles 14, Zira, the Ethiopian, came with an army of a thousand's thousand, which is one million. And Zira's aim was to destroy Judah entirely, to take her land, and behind Zira was the devil himself, whose aim was to destroy the people of God and therefore to prevent the coming of Jesus Christ. And Asa's reaction is beautiful. He does not trust in his army, although his army was really impressive. Verse 8 tells us how many soldiers he had. In fact, he says in his prayer in verse 11, We have no power. That's how he described himself. We have no power. He does not trust, therefore, in his army when one million soldiers from a foreign nation come against him. He trusts in God. That's his prayer in verse 11. Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many, that's the Ethiopians, they have many, or with them that have no power, that's Judah, they have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee, we rely upon thee, we trust in thee. And in thy name we go against this multitude. O Lord, thou art our God, let not man prevail against thee. And so Asa confesses God's power and God's sovereignty and God's faithfulness to his covenant promises and hopes in God's mercy. And God does not fail. Asa, and God never fails his people who pray unto him. In other words, Asa trusts in God alone, with humility and patience submits to him, expects all good things from him, loves, fears, and glorifies him alone. He kept the first commandment. But sadly, that's not how Asa ends his reign. He had a good beginning. He trusted God when he was a younger man. He passed those earlier tests of trusting God. But as he grows older, his trust for God weakens. And his, weak, his weakening faith leads him to trust in the arm of flesh. In chapter 14 he says, we rest on thee. On what is he resting in chapter 16? On man. Baasha, who was the king of the northern kingdom, he was the third king of the northern kingdom, Jeroboam, Nadab, Baasha, 
Baasha comes against Asa in his 36th year. Remember, Asa had had a great victory against one million Ethiopian soldiers several years before this, but instead of calling upon Jehovah his God, he runs for help to Syria and asks Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, to come and deliver him. That was a common sin of the kings of Israel and Judah. Instead of asking help from God, they would make leagues and agreements with other nations. And notice that he takes the silver and the gold out of the treasures of the house of the Lord and gives them as a bribe, as it were, to Ben-Hadad to come and help him. And so Asa, in this instance, failed to trust in God alone with humility and patience to submit to him and to expect all good things from him only. And God was provoked to anger by this lack of faith on Asa's part. And so he sends a, a prophet to rebuke him. Chapter 16, verse 7. Hanani, the seer, came to Asa, king of Judah, with a stern rebuke. He told him, you did not rely on God, you relied on the king of Syria. You have done very foolishly. So you can see the courage of this prophet to rebuke a foolish king. And Asa makes matters worse by flying into a rage and throwing this faithful prophet into prison because he would not be contradicted. He was the king. How dare this prophet come and rebuke him? And then several years later, Asa became sick in his feet, we are told. And again, he does not trust in God, but rather he goes to the physicians, verse 12 tells us. Likely, this disease was sent upon Asa as a chastisement for what he had done in his previous battle in trusting Syria and then casting one of God's faithful prophets into prison. And most likely, too, this was a painful disease. Some people say it might have been a gout. We don't know. But Asa called for the doctors, for the physicians. He did not pray to or trust in the Lord. He put his faith in the miracles of medical science. Now, it's not wrong for us to call a doctor when we are sick. In fact, it is our calling to use whatever means are available to us in the day in which we live. But it is wrong for us to trust in doctors. And to imagine that doctors are the ones who are able to heal us and to forget that ultimately it is God who makes any kind of medical treatment that we might receive effectual according to his will. Yet for all that, his good beginning and his miserable ending, Asa was a child of God. He had his faults, he had his weaknesses, and he remains for us in Scripture as an example of one who was strong in faith at one point in his life, but also foolish in his unbelief at another point in his life. And we see in Asa a picture of us. Sometimes we have experiences where we trust God and we honor God in trusting Him. Other times we are foolish and trust in men. We should not therefore point the finger at Asa, but rather look and see ourselves in Asa and ask God to strengthen our faith that we might not be guilty as Asa was of trusting the creature rather than the Creator. The first commandment forbids all idolatry. Idolatry is the sin of having some rival for the worship of God, some other object of trust, some other object of the affections and the desires apart from the true God. 
Idolatry is defined in answer 95. Idolatry is instead of or besides that one true God who has manifested himself in his word to contrive or have any other object in which men place their trust. God is the incomparable one. Everything else apart from God is creature. And therefore, no one and nothing even comes close to the worth and the glory and the greatness of God. And Israel, as they stood at the foot of Mount Sinai, must have understood this. They, after all, had seen evidence of this. They had seen how God had destroyed the Egyptians. That all of the gods of the Egyptians had proved to be worthless vanities in the face of God. God had plagued Egypt with many terrible plagues, and the gods of the Egyptians were powerless to help. They were humiliated and brought down low. And now Israel stands at the foot of Mount Sinai, having seen all of the power of God, and it's clear to them that God who has chosen them, and loved them, and redeemed them with an outstretched arm, he is the one true God. So how could they even think of having another God besides Jehovah? Although it was easy to say, I will have Jehovah as my God, that's what an Israelite would have said. It proved more difficult for Israel to say, I will have Jehovah alone as my God. The temptation always was for Israel to have Jehovah and an idol beside Jehovah. They would say, oh yes, Jehovah, he is the supreme God. He is the greatest of all possible gods. There is no God like Jehovah. But perhaps we can have a secondary God. Not even close to the glory of Jehovah. Not on the same level as Jehovah. Or perhaps we can share our worship and affection between two different kinds of gods. Perhaps we can even give Jehovah the most of our affection and worship. And just a little bit of affection and worship to this other god. That was how the Israelites behaved throughout their history. They always said, we worship Jehovah our God, and Baal, and Dagon, and Ashtoreth, and Moab. But, but, but Jehovah, he's still the supreme God, he is our God, but we need to worship the other gods as well as supplements to God. But God said, no, all your worship, all your love, all your trust, all your submission, all your devotion, belongs to me, not for anyone else. I demand all of it. I claim all of it because you belong to me, Israel. I loved you. I chose you. I redeemed you. I created you. You're mine. And therefore, I will have no rivals. Therefore, you shall not have any gods before me. And the Catechism points to four different kinds of sins, all of which begin with S, the four S's, which are common violations of the first commandment. Sorcery, soothsaying, superstition, and invocation of saints. Sorcery is another name for magic or witchcraft. And it is the attempt to use the powers of this world, hidden powers, real or imagined, to bring about some advantage for yourself or to bring about some evil upon another. And this kind of sorcery would involve things like special words, spells or incantations, or special kinds of substances, potions, or drugs. We are called by the first commandment to flee from and to avoid all kinds of sorcery. 
Soothsaying is a kind of sorcery which involves especially the attempt to tell the future. It is the unlawful attempt to find out that future which God has hidden in his counsel. Soothsayers will use tarot cards, crystal balls, tea leaves, astrology, hand reading, and the like. It's common enough today. It's not harmless fun. It is fundamentally idolatry. Another kind of soothsaying involves trying to contact the dead by means of seances and mediums so that the dead will be able to tell us things about what life was like beyond the grave. King Saul, remember, was guilty of this kind of practice. But we must avoid soothsaying because we must trust that God, who knows the future, is able to guide us by his word. We must be content, therefore, not to know those things which God has not chosen to reveal to us and to trust in every step of the way. Superstition is the belief that mysterious powers control our lives and not the providence of God. Superstitious people do not trust God. They live in fear of bad luck and they live in hope of having some good luck. And so when they see number 13, they get nervous because 13 is an unlucky number according to them. Or when a black cat passes their pathway, they're affected by that. Or horseshoes are lucky, and so on and so forth. People are controlled by these kind of superstitious beliefs. And the medieval church was full of all kinds of foolish superstition. Superstition is the denial of the sovereignty of God. We believe God is sovereign. God works together all things for our good, even the number 13, even breaking a murder, any of those things which are supposed to bring bad luck, all of that is under the sovereign providence of God. And so we don't need to worry about sitting on rule 13 on Friday the 13th if you decide to fly on that particular day. An invocation of saints is a peculiar practice of Roman Catholicism. To invoke is to ask help of someone, usually by means of prayer. We are to trust the one true God, to believe on him alone, and not to invoke saints or Mary or anyone else, because God alone is to be the object of our trust. We flee from these things. We flee from sorcery and soothsaying and superstition and the invocation of saints and other creatures. We give ourselves wholly to God. We pray to him through Jesus Christ alone, by the power of the Holy Spirit alone. You might think, well, those things, sorcery, soothsaying, superstition, and invocation of saints are very far removed from me. I would not be at all tempted by those kinds of things. How would I be guilty of idolatry? Those are only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to idolatry. Idolatry is to trust in anything else apart from the one true and living God. There is the idolatry of not having any God, or living as if there is no God. Atheists are idolaters. Every man knows that he is dependent upon something for his existence. Even the hardened atheist knows that. And every man therefore worships some kind of of God. And God comes to every man, even the hardened atheist, and says to him, Worship me alone. And some men are so stubborn and so wicked that they will say, No, I will not worship any God. And that person really makes himself to be God. 
He declares himself to be independent of God, which is impossible, so he finds for himself some other object in which he will place his trust. He trusts in himself, he trusts in society, in mankind in general, he trusts in his own abilities, his own wisdom, his own wealth, whatever it might be, he finds something in which he will trust. He might say, I'm not religious, but he has still something he loves and something he devotes his life to, whether it's himself or his family or the good of mankind, whatever it might be, he has something and therefore is an idolater. There's also the inordinate love and desire for things of this world. Paul says that covetousness is idolatry. A man who loves money, a man who lives for money, for the pursuit of money, is an idolater. He imagines that money will be able to give him security, that money will be able to give him happiness, that money will save his life if it comes down to that. He worships gold, therefore. He might not bow down to a statue of gold, as the ancient idolaters did, but he still worships gold because gold is the object of his trust. And every good gift of God can become idolatry if we take it to its extreme. And our society, although it is becoming increasingly atheistic and materialistic, is an idolatrous society. All you have to do is go to a sports stadium or a concert of some kind and you'll see thousands and thousands of adoring fans who are worshipping the god of sport or the god of entertainment. They follow these superstars as if they were gods. They read religiously every information they can find about these men and women. It's really idolatry on their part. And if something gets in the way of our worship of God and our devotion to God, whatever that might be, it becomes idolatry. Perhaps it's television. Perhaps television keeps you away from prayer and studying the Word of God and coming to church. If it does, television has become an idol in your life. Perhaps it's your computer. Perhaps you're addicted to using your computer. Perhaps it's a video game that you have. If it gets in the way of your worshipping God, then it has become an idol. Idolatry is a thought of trusting in something or someone or depending upon something instead of God. And finding your hope and your pleasure and your meaning in life in something else rather than God. Think of the drunkard or the drug addict, for example. They have convinced themselves that they can only function in life if they have a drink or if they use drugs. And these things help them to get through the day. They have become guilty of idolatry. A Christian says, I do not need such thing, to be a happy and fulfilled person. I am God. God is my portion. God is my delight. And I renounce and forsake all creatures for the sake of my God. And so we are called to mortify the old man of flesh who is an idolater. We must not have our belly for our God. We must not love pleasure. We must love God. Another example of idolatry in our modern age is the worship of the state. And you see that especially in the Western world with the worship of the state in this way, the modern welfare system. There are people who look to the government for everything. They live off the government. The government operates in some of the Western countries a cradle 
to the grave system. They care for you when you're a child. They give you free everything throughout your childhood. And then when you're older and don't want to work, they give you enough to live off for the rest of your life and then they give you a pension at the end. And the masses have, been, have become accustomed to receiving whatever they need and whatever they want from the government. That's why, for example, you look at things like Greece today and they're rioting on the streets because the government is saying, we can't afford it any longer, we're not going to give you what we used to give you, and the people think they're entitled to it, and so they're rioting on the streets. And what is the solution to all of our problems today? Elect a new government. The government will deliver us from everything that will harm us. When something happens, it's the government's fault. The government has to fix it. And if they don't, get a new government. Have a new president, have a new prime minister, or whatever. That's the hope of many today. And that's what the government wants. They want the people to become reliant upon them so that they can dictate to the people everything in their lives. The government wants to have complete control of every aspect of life. They tell you what to eat. They tell you what you should do in your private life. They tell you how to raise your children. And more and more, the government is encroaching upon the rights of the individual citizen. And that is a form of idolatry. The Bible says, put not your trust in princes. In other words, don't look to the government. Look to God. Look to God for all of your needs. Trust in Him alone. Yes, the government is a tool. Yes, the government is a means in the hands of God. But don't rely yourself entirely upon the government. And when the government comes along and says, you must do this, and you know it's against God's word, you must say, I honor those in authority over me, but I must submit to God alone. I must obey God rather than men. And coming closer to home, one of the most prevalent forms of idolatry among us is the fear of man. When we fear man, when we are more concerned about what man might think of, it, of us, when we desire above all things to please man, when we are afraid of the disapproval of man, man has become God in our eyes. When we are willing to disobey God to please our wife or our husband or our parents or our children, or our boss, or our friends, or our colleagues, we have forgotten what question and answer 94 says. I renounce and forsake all creatures rather than commit even the least thing contrary to his will. And that's seen among young people and children today in peer pressure. <clears throat> peer pressure is a form of idolatry. When a school friend comes to you and says, I want you to do this and you know it's wrong, and you're afraid of being laughed at by that school friend, you have placed that school friend in the place of God. You have said, I will obey my school friend rather than God. He must say, rather, I love you and I honor you and I respect you, but I cannot disobey God. And if that means our friendship is over, so be it. If that means I must be ostracized and made fun of by everyone else in the school, so be it. If that means I must give up, all social interaction with other people, so be it. If that means I must be 
punished by the state and cast into prison, so be it. If that means I must die rather than disobey God, so be it. That's what God means when he says, I, if I shall have no other gods before me. Can we keep such a commandment? Has anyone ever been able to keep this commandment of God's law? We've only got to the first commandment and we've already seen it's impossible for us to keep. Only one person in the history of the world was able to keep this one commandment perfectly. And we all know who that was, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ wholeheartedly kept the first commandment. He entirely loved and was devoted to God his Father. He knew God like no one else could because he is the eternal Son of God in the bosom of his Father. And he came to reveal God to us. We would greatly know him as well. He trusted in his Father at all times. He never wavered in that trust, even when God brought him along the difficult pathway of suffering. God said to him, go into the wilderness for 40 days and be tempted of the devil. He went. When he was hungry, and the devil tempted him, he said, I will trust God rather than deny him. I know God brought me here for a purpose. I will trust him. When he was abandoned by all of his friends at the end of his life, he continued to trust God. When God gave him the cup of suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane, he took it. When God led him up Calvary's hill to the cross, he went, trusting God. When God poured out his wrath upon Jesus Christ on the cross, he endured it, trusting God. He loved his Father. He desired only to glorify him. He was willing to renounce and forsake all creatures for the sake of his Father's glory. And how did man react when they saw a man who perfectly kept the first commandment of God's law? They hated him. They could not stand it to see a man who was wholly devoted to God, a man who loved God with his whole heart and was devoted to God and trusted God and submitted to God in all things. The Pharisees pretended to love God, pretended to be great admirers of the law of God, but Christ's perfection came and showed them up, exposed them to the hypocrites that they were. And Christ's perfection shows us up too. Shows us what we should be. Shows us what we will be one day in heaven when we will have no more sin and will be able to devote ourselves entirely and wholeheartedly to God. But it's not his example that saves us. His example might shame us his example might even encourage us in a way, but it cannot save us. The first commandment cannot save us because the first commandment is too strict. Love God perfectly, show Him wholehearted devotion. If I said that was the condition of salvation, we would all despair this morning because we cannot even do that for one hour. But Christ kept the first commandment and all the other commandments too for us. And he paid on the cross for our transgression of this commandment. We were not devoted to God as we should have been, but Christ was. And Christ devoted himself to God in such a way that he even was willing to pay the price of our rebellion. He took upon himself the guilt of our idolatry and pay the price of that idolatry in our place. And thus he became our redeemer, the one who delivered us 
from the bondage of our sins by means of Christ. And that redemption earns for us a place in heaven. And earns for us too, even in this life, the Holy Spirit, who makes us devoted to God. The God who loved us, the God who chose us, the God who redeemed us from all of our sins, and the God who owns us, body and soul. And in our gratitude to him, we say, Thou art the Lord, my God. Thou hast delivered me from bondage of sin and death, and I will have no other God before thee. God grant it for Christ's sake. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we confess that our love for thee is so weak. Our trust wavers. We ask the Lord that will forgive us for this, our sin. We thank thee that Christ died on the cross for our, our idolatry as well as for all of our other sins. And cause us to do thee supreme in our lives and to renounce and forsake all creatures rather than do anything which is against thy will for Christ's sake. Amen. Yeah. 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 Yeah.